All right, so Dr. Jeffrey Torson will be presenting Emerging Diseases, RHD, ECUN, and CDV. All right, you guys hear me all right? Okay. Yes, yes. Excellent, all right. So I um, hope you guys are ready for this um, and ready for me again. It's going to be a lot of me this afternoon, so I apologize you have to go through that. But moving right along, we're going to be talking about these emerging diseases. So just a little, little picture again so you guys know who's talking. Um, we're going to go through, as she said, RHDV, distemper, echiniculi in guinea pigs, um, URIs slash otitis in our guinea pigs and then some enteritis syndrome in hamsters. All right, so first off, rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus, something that's um, been talked about a little bit more recently. So this is a Khaleesi virus of the genus Lagovirus. Um, it affects domestic rabbits, Eastern cottontails, hares, and wild European rabbits. Um, there are two strains of this, so one and two, very aptly named. Um, the first one was first identified in China in 1984 and did make its way over to the United States, um, but was outcompeted by the second form of this, which emerged in 2010 from France and then made its way to the United States and Mexico in 2020. All right, so what can we expect from this disease? What do we see? Fortunately, a lot of times it's sudden death. Um, but we will see just the general signs, inappetence, lethargy. You can see over here, we just got a, you know, a rabbit that just looks generally sick. His ears are pinned back, looks a little dehydrated, um, just kind of a loaf there. Um, <clears throat> oh, I'm being told that my video is off. Um, turn on when you can. Okay, um, we'll do that. Um, let's see if I can get this. All right. All right. Sorry about that. Um, all right. But then moving right along with these clinical signs, um, we can see fever, icterus, or yellow um, mucous membranes, um, eyes, things like that. Um, we'll see neurologic signs, seizures, ataxia, paresis. Um, one of the bigger things, bleeding from the nose, mouth, genitals, or rectum, um, dyspnea, as we often see with very sick rabbits that are coming in that are unfortunately looking like they might pass away soon. Um, and then a little bit more information. So incubation, three to five days. Uh, mortality really varies based on what literature source you're using very widely, 5% to 90%. Um, I haven't come in contact with this disease personally yet. Um, it has not come into Indiana, um, but is is getting close. Um, Survivors can become carriers and they can shed up to two months. Um, transmission, typically direct contact, urine, feces, blood, milk. So that's more of a vertical type of transmission um, from mom to young, mucus, saliva. Um, and the virus can be viable for three and a half months at room temperature and even longer, seven and a half months at near freezing temperature. So it it stays around for a bit. So definitely need to be cautious about this one with our with our pet rabbits. Um, how are we gonna treat this? So mostly supportively, unfortunately, there's non-infective antiviral at this time. Um, if we suspect an animal has this disease, we are gonna wanna isolate them. Um, we have an entire just kind of room that's in a very accessible area of the hospital next to a door where, you know, not, not our usual animals will come in. Um, we've got PPE that's all lined up over there. So, you know, things to cover your feet, hands, face, um, you know, all of your clothing. Um, and when we have these animals, just the, you know, second form of this, they can get through. And one of the reasons that they, you know, it did outcompete the, you know, RHDB1 form is because they can get through because it's, a more effective strategy for viruses to keep the animal alive longer so that it can give it to another animal. Um, but ways to support them through this, you know, if it's affecting the liver, which is one of the main tissues that we're going to want to send into the lab, if we are suspecting that the state lab and 
you know, if you do suspect you have a case of this, definitely talk to your state lab and they will tell you if you need to do a necropsy and you need to, you know, what, what is needed to be sent over there. They're very good about that. You know, I've called them many times and they, you know, who weren't really concerned about a certain case, but they, you know, I get to talk to a doctor right away. So they're very good about that. Um, you know, fluids, feeding, liver support of medication, um, if they need a blood transfusions, anything that you can help them get through this is what's going to be supportive. Uh, prevention has probably been our biggest thing so far. Uh, MedGene has been awesome. It's an American company. I have their contact information right here, uh, their phone number, email address, um, Talked to them at conferences before. They're great guys. Um, you know, very easy to talk to. Um, and they're working on a lot of different stuff. Um, they've seen very good response from this vaccination. No deaths linked to it. Um, it is recommended to be given annually. Um, what we typically do and what they recommend is to give it initially. Um, we give it subcutaneously in the left hind limb um, just to kind of keep it consistent where we're giving it and so that we know if there are any reactions that, you know, that's potentially a cause and, and where it was given. Um, usually do a booster about three weeks and then, um, you know, booster annually after that. That's the current recommendation from those who are making this vaccine. And then biosecurity is also going to be very important for this. So what is included in that? Um, keeping rabbits indoors. You know, it, it can be nice to have them outdoors, but as you can see right here, this is just a rabbit chilling in my front yard. I took this picture when I was going home from work right, you know, one day and I was shocked he's just hanging out there. I get rabbits in, you know, in my backyard all the time, but they're not usually this relaxed. Um, but they are out there. Um, and you know, they're going to the bathroom everywhere, urinating, bowel movements. I'm sure they've got some sort of secretions if they got this disease. Um, so if rabbits are outdoors, they're unfortunately going to likely come in contact with this. And um, going to wash your hands. No, I talked about that in the last um, lecture, but um, big to do here before and after handling your pets, especially since we are going to be outside. Um, and, you know, our clothes or shoes are going to come in contact with any of the excrement that's coming from these wild rabbits that... Um, could potentially be harboring this disease. So we want to, you know, do our due diligence, change, wash hands, um, try to keep that away from our pet rabbits if we can. Um, and if we're in an, an endemic area, obviously, you know, keep wild and pet rabbits away from each other and new rabbits, uh, quarantine about two weeks. That, that seems to be what we're shooting for right now. Um, and then some recent activity. So in July, you know, just a couple months ago in um, this year um, in Cook County. So that's where Chicago is very close to Indiana. Um, I know from experience, I go there all the time. My family's there. It's just three hour drive from Indianapolis. There is a confirmed um, case of you know, at least a couple um, of RHDV2. So it's, it's creeping right along. Um, you know, even if your rabbit is outside, you're doing all these biosecurity precautions, vaccine is definitely recommended because it, it can happen. There can be breakthroughs. So definitely keep all that in mind. All right, moving on here to the next disease, distemper in ferrets. So got a sick looking ferret here. Um, you can see he's got a little bit of diarrhea. There's some matted feces right here. Very thin, it's quiet. Um, this is the canine distemper virus that they will get They're highly susceptible to it. It is becoming more rare due to vaccination, but is something that we can see in areas where um, you know, it's endemic in, in lots of puppies and maybe um, it's not a very compliant area for vaccines, both for dogs and ferrets, um, or if there are rescues that have both these animals and they're in close contact with each other and they're young animals. It's, it seems to be a lot in the young animals that have not gotten their initial vaccines yet. Uh, what do we see? We'll see this just crusty, awful looking guy right here. Really, really sad looking guy. Crusty on his face, you know, crusty on his paw pads. That's that pedal hyperkeratosis that we'll see. Um, they'll have a fever. Um, they'll also have neurologic signs a lot of time and NGI signs. So they can just be totally weak, tetraparetic, not, you know, 
weakness in all their limbs. They can have seizures, ataxia, you know, loss of balance. Um, they can just have behavioral changes. They can just you know, start acting more aggressive. Um, what kind of diagnostics thing we do? There is a PCR that um, you, can, you can swab secretions and it gives pretty good results. It's not hundred percent, but it does give good results. A lot of times we'll, we will see these characteristic clinical signs and there'll be you know, young ferret, it'll be a large group um, and they'll be exposed and you know, we'll, we'll want to initiate treatment based on that. Um, and what kind of treatment can we do for these guys? You know, historically, um, supportive care has been a big thing and it's often thought to be fatal, but um, going to a recent talk and seeing Dr. Johnson Delaney out of the Pacific Northwest, she deals with so many of these that are coming in through the pet trade, she sees a lot of, you know, young old ferrets, and she's had, you know, pretty good success up to 80, 90% of you know, these guys get through this with, with a very specific protocol that she has, you know, lots of fluids, you know, and she's trying to give them vitamins and, and things that they're just not getting because they're not eating as much, you know, we'll give them vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin K, um, interferon and antiviral, Meloxicam for any inflammation that they have because this is an inflammatory disease. Famotidine because it can affect the GI tract. And it, a lot of these ferrets that are sick in general seem to need famotidine because they're not wanting to eat and they can get gastric ulceration. Um, diphenhydramine or Benadryl because it can cause a um, histamine release, buprenorphine again for pain, flurbiprofen, which is very good for all of this ocular discharge. And another helpful thing for supporting is cleaning up some of that ocular nasal discharge, clearing up those, you know, breathing pathways, letting them see, letting them smell, um, you know, assist feeding them, hydration is crucial. And this is something that we're definitely going to want to get in touch with a veterinarian about because they're going to have all these things that we need to, to help and, you know, look after them and keep them in an isolated environment. Because this is also another opportunity for us to use that quarantine wing that we have. Um, you know, luckily um, for this disease, there is a good vaccine out there and it's readily available. Um, it can be given at a young age, um, should be given every three to four weeks until about 14 weeks and then booster annually after that. And that, that, is, that is very effective. All right, moving on to the next thing here, encephalotozoan caniculi in guinea pigs. So let's see, I have a picture here, not of a guinea pig, of a rabbit, because this is a disease that we will commonly see in rabbits, um, but are seeing a little bit more often in, in our rodents, guinea pigs in particular. And this is a microsporidia. It's an obligate intracellular. And I'll talk a little bit more about the biology of this disease in my next talk, which is going very specifically in depth about it. Um, but in rabbits, we'll often see neurologic disease, but they can be asymptomatic carriers. Um, there are multiple different strains. The ones that affect rodents are typically two and three. So in our guinea pigs, what kind of clinical signs do we see? Reportedly, usually not anything. Usually the subclinical. There, you know, there's something that we'll see incidentally on an necropsy. Uh, but there have been um, some recent reports of those with torticollis and um, just kind of turning around, twisting around some neurologic symptoms. And then, you know, because of the next disease I'm going to talk about, they you know, might be treated for something else. You know, we'll look at a necropsy, we'll look at different tissues, and it'll be positive for this. So a lot of time, it's, it's an incidental finding. Uh, potential things that we might see in the future, if this is something that grows, might be you know, neurologic signs such as facial contracture, which we saw in the last slide with that rabbit, uh, head tilt, which is something that we'll commonly see in the neck disease. Um, diagnosis um, seems to be mostly postmortem at this point. There's not an effective antemortem or before um, death um, test for this, which is unfortunate. Treatment, you know, with with not knowing as much about this one and it not having a lot of clinical signs, a lot of times it'll go untreated. But if it's something that you might suspect, an anti-inflammatory can be very important because with most strains of this disease, 
it causes a lot of inflammation to the tissues. So an anti-inflammatory might be very helpful. Um, prevention, um, quarantining any new guinea pigs. Um, you know, if you, you know, have a guinea pig that might've passed away, might've had this disease, use an oxidizing disinfectant, so something strong to clean anything that they might've come in contact with, um, probably replacing any bedding um, or toys, anything like that, or just very deeply cleaning it. And um, as I'll talk about a little bit more in the next one, immune compromised humans can get this disease. So we're gonna wanna be wary when, you know, we're around these animals that look like they might have this disease because we might need to be a little bit more cautious. All right. So moving on to the next thing, otitis interna and medius. So looking at the inner ear of guinea pigs, something that we will very commonly see in these guys. I, I've seen a couple just this past week that have had health tilts and I'm very suspicious of this disease. Um, and it's something that, you know, even if we have a guinea pig right here, he doesn't appear to have much of a head tilt and maybe doesn't have any clinical signs. But if we take um, an x-ray or CT scan for another reason, we might incidentally find that they've got inner ears that are filled with gunk. And that is consistent with otitis interna and media because it's filling that tympanic bulla with fluid. Um, obviously, it can be more severe and also um, an image of that in just a moment. Um, and a lot of times it's associated with chronic respiratory infection. So something that our rodents will often get, respiratory infections. Um, and the way that this occurs is that the bacteria will travel up the auditory tube and into the middle ear because there is connection there. And it can cause this disease to happen. And what kind of bacteria do we see? Streptococcus equi subspecies epidemicus, um, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Bordetella, Brachyseptica, Pastorella, Actinobacillus, Pseudomonas, Aeruginosa. Obviously, there can be others, but these are the most common that are seen. And there is, unfortunately, a higher percentage in inbred animals. So that'll be you know, why a lot of times um, we'll see it in younger animals that are coming right from the pet stores. Um, because you know, you know, maybe there is, unfortunately, some, some inbreeding that can happen. Because as we all know from having guinea pigs, if there's multiple of them and they're not altered, they're going to make more guinea pigs. So they're, and if they're siblings, they, they don't care. They don't really have any sort of moral compass for that type of thing. So they, and breeding can unfortunately happen and very easily. All right. So um, image right here, we can see this tympanic bulla right here is just completely obliterated, showing signs of that um, otitis interna and media. So what kind of clinical signs will we see? Um, vestibular issues, um, like a head tilt, as I've said multiple times, they can have ataxia, or just kind of being off balance, circling, facial paralysis. Um, they can have sneezing and nasal discharge if this is associated with respiratory disease and you know they don't have the neurologic symptoms for it quite yet. Um, diagnostics, um, bacterial culture, um, a lot of times that'll have to come from nasal discharge, but if for some reason there is very severe ear disease and you're you know, doing a procedure to clean things out, you can culture from there and get a bacteria. Um, imaging, um, as you can see here, this is a CT scan. You can also look at MRI or radiographs. Radiographs will definitely see changes in that um, inner ear, the tympanic bulla. Um, but you likely will not see the fluid build up. So you're going to need to be, see, use more advanced imaging for that. <clears throat> um, and then moving on to treatment. So you can see this little guy does have some head salt here. Um, so ideally antibiotics based on culture, but that can be really, really difficult. And obviously you want to be good antibiotic stewards, but this is one where it's so common that getting them on a tier one antibiotic can be very helpful along with an anti-inflammatory and can lead to resolution of symptoms. Again, if you can get the culture, it's ideal, but there are situations where that can be challenging and you know, an antibiotic can be very helpful. Um, surgery, a lot of times this is very high risk and, and we don't often recommend it. It's another reason why empirical treatment or treating based on the suspicion can be good, but 
Now, there have been reports of total ear canal ablation or, or lateral bull osteotomy. So that's kind of going into this area and either removing it, um, you know, the whole you know, area there and all of the disease bone that's associated with it, or just opening it up and, and scooping the disease material out and debriding as much as possible. Um, and another new one um, that's been um, recently in the literature to have a little bit more success is endoscopic myringotomy. So we're using an endoscope, looking in there, kind of flushing. You can um, flush based on um, culture with an antibiotic, and, and that has seen some success. And that that definitely needs to be um, done under anesthesia, though, because I don't I don't really know a guinea pig that's going to tolerate that awake. All right, moving on to the next section here are little hamsters with enteritis syndrome, or as lots of people like to refer to it as wet tail. So, um, what are the different types of etiologies for this? Uh, bacterial, yeast, parasitic, or combination of all three? Why not? Um, the bacteria that we see, Lawsonia intracellularis, Clostridium, Campylobacter, um, yeast can be Torulopsis, um, parasites can be Hymenolepsis, Giardia, Trichomonads, um, and there can obviously be combinations of that. Clinical signs will be that diarrhea, which is causing the wet tail because the really wet feces that we're seeing all the time are going to be sticking to the tail, making it wet. Um, they're not going to want to eat. They'll be anorexic. Um, definitely weight loss, definitely dehydration and paracute death. So they can really go downhill very fast. They're small animals. Any loss of hydration can be just so detrimental to them that they'll, they'll die really quickly a lot of the time, especially the young ones, those in the pet stores. You know, we, we try to do our best, but sometimes we will lose them despite our best efforts. Um, so for this one, you know, fecal cytology or culture is obviously ideal. Um, fecal cytology, you know, fecal flotation can be really helpful. A cytology can see those types of things like Giardia. So, you know, it's, it's pretty quick. Most of the time it's pretty cheap um, and it doesn't take that long to get the results. So it's a good thing to look at to decide, you know, what kind of, you know, if we need to get an antiparasitic on and you know, what have you. Um, treatment. You know, antiparasitic, antibiotic, antifungal, you know, ideally based off of cultures, but, um, you know, there are some more common different types of bacteria that, that do come up. So if there are severe cases, you're worried this animal's not going to die or is going to die, sorry. Um, you don't really want to wait for culture because that can take a week. It's not wrong to get them on a tier one antibiotic and, and try to help them out as best as you can. But fluid therapy, supportive feedings are going to be the hallmarks and the most important part of this because, as I said, when they lose hydration, they go downhill so quickly and they can go into hypovolemic shock. And that's the biggest thing that does it for them is that they're just losing so much fluid so quickly. So we need to replace that and help them through it as, as best as we can. Prognosis, unfortunately, often poor because of that loss of hydration. And, um, See, I am actually, this is the last slide, a couple of my references here. Um, so now we can kind of go into the question and, and answer. Okay, we do have one question for you. Okay. Um, are there restrictions in sales on the HVDV2 vaccine or who can administrate it? Um, let's see, I do not know about the sales personally. Um, I do know who sells it. Um, I, I don't think I specifically talked to them about that. Um, definitely recommended that um, someone that's at least working with a veterinarian, veterinarian does give the vaccine um, just so we can keep that in a record. But um, I, I will be honest, I don't actually know if there is a, is a law against who can administer this. Um, there is a lot of good information though um, on the... Um, the House Rabbit, um, which is a huge corporation, very reliable source for any care for rabbits, that um, they can give you a lot of that information. Um, they also have a lot of links. Um, this this rabbit.org resource can be very helpful for that. So I apologize that I don't quite know the answer to that question, but as far as I know, I don't know of any restrictions. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. 
Mm -hmm. I don't have any more questions in the question box. If you have a question, please submit it in the question box and we'll get to it. Uh, it looks like one just came in. Oh, yes. um, it seems like an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure mm -hmm. for any of these. Other than the vaccination strategies, what other preventive recommend, recommendations do you have for larger group, uh, groups of animals? Yes. All right. So um, I will um, talk a little bit more about this, um, but not in enormous depth in one of my later talks, but um, with larger groups of animals. So groups of backyard poultry or large breeding facilities, um, rescues, those types of things. Um, a lot of the um, you know rescues in the area, um, you know, not necessarily with us, but they'll have some sort of veterinarian that they'll talk to, whether it be someone local close by or a state veterinarian. Um, so just that um, communication, what to look out for, visual exams, that can be super helpful for prevention. Another big thing is limiting who can come in and out um, because you wanna try and control any disease that can come in and out of a facility that's got a large group of animals because any person, any animal can introduce a disease that can potentially be detrimental for the whole flock herd, what have you. So those are, those are even simpler things to do than vaccine. Um, I guess, uh, you know, in, in word they're easy to do, but if you've got a large group preventing, you know, wild animals can obviously be very difficult. Um, people, it becomes a little bit easier though, you know, just having signs, um, you know, controlling who can come in um, to your facility, hugely important. Okay, thank you. I did yes. get a comment in the chat. Um, any veterinarian that wants to administer the MedGene needs to contact MedGene and they will get that set up for you. Awesome. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Okay, well, thank, thank you for that. You.